are in our fall series, Infinite and Intimate, and we are going to do our best with this video to grind the first 14 verses of John chapter one into you. We're gonna use this video and over and over and over because what we find in what's going on in this series and in life is that there is this all-powerful, infinite God who is deeply intimate and relational. It is a juxtaposition, which means to put alongside that contrasts. How can an infinite God who knows all and, and sustains all be intimately interested in the lives of seven billion people? People, but he is. Scripture reveals it as such, and we recognize that there is something unique that happened with Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ is the point of everything that ever was and everything that ever will be. Jesus Christ is the very first word of creation. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and through him all things were made. So we know that, but what we're recognizing today is there is this other thing going on, that Jesus Christ is God with us. What does it mean to have God with us? And what would that do to life on earth? We believe here at the Foundry Church that it's seriously a fun thing to know that God is with us. It's a wonderful gift. It should bring hope to you like, um, like you would feel if you had to get in a fight with your childhood bully and you brought Evander Holyfield to the contest. You would feel infinitely better about your odds at that moment. And this is what it feels like for us to know that this infinite Almighty God is also intimately involved in our life, and the way he became intimately involved is he became God with us. We are going to hear two scriptures this morning, and it comes out of John chapter 2, and in John chapter 2, we see a wild kind of set of stories, and, and what blows my mind is what happens and what Jesus does really isn't, by our American definition of Christianity, isn't the Christian thing to do. Listen up. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was in there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied. My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum, where his mother and brothers and his disciples there they stayed for a few days. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at the tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all of the temple courts, both the sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned the tables. To those who sold doves, he said, Get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it is written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then responded to him, What sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and I will raise in th again in three days. They replied, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you are going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. Now, while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, many people saw the signs he was performing and believed in his name. 
but Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all people. He did not need any testimony about mankind, for he knew what was in each person. Find this amazing, because how much more unchristian could a text be? Let's just think for a second. Let's put it into our modern context. Let's say you get married and your family offers a keg of Bud Light, right? You're like, you can't say this at church. We're going to talk about it, okay? And the keg of Bud Light runs dry, which is always, it's just good that they would be empty. But anyways, um, the keg of Bud Light runs dry. And someone comes up to, let's say, the pastor and says, we're out of beer. Here's 200 bucks, go get some. No, no, better yet, my mom comes up to me and says, Eric, we're out of beer. Go get some. Okay, so you send your kids on beer runs. Is that what I'm assuming here? Is it, like, does anybody else feel a little tension with this? Anybody else feel some, some strange tension going on in this? Because this is a setting where Jesus Christ is at a wedding, and they run out of wine. And not only does Jesus replace the wine with, what was it, six jars, 20 to 30 gallons? Oh, call your liver. That's going to hurt. That's a lot of wine. And Jesus turns it into good wine. Not the cheap stuff, but the good stuff. It's like my mom saying, go get a keg. And I come back with Founders All Day IPA. And everybody went, why'd you bring this out last? Why'd you do this last? See, we don't often allow scripture to, to speak in our context, but that's what it needs to do. We need to know how strange this is. And what's going on in this is that Jesus is being driven to do something he doesn't want to do. Did you notice the line in there? Woman, why are you doing this? It's not my time. Eugene Peterson, in his translation of the, of the scriptures in the, in the message, says, woman, why are you pushing me? Have you ever had that with your mom? Yeah. <laughs> Amen. I love it. Yeah. Woman's hard on me. All right. <laughs> your mom's going to have a word with you, young man. All right. <laughs> All right. Oh, that was awesome. So have you ever been in that situation where you do something and you're a little embarrassed? Your mom's like, say you're sorry. And you're like, mom, I'm not going to say I'm sorry. We're in public. I'm awesome. No. And then she doesn't. Like, mom, talk enough. We'll talk about it later. And she's like, no, do it. it. Just notice the tension here. Jesus says, woman, why are you pushing me? Why are you pushing me? And then she does what moms do best. She ignores what Jesus says and says to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Oh, fine, mom. We don't get this. Like, do you begin to feel Jesus in humanity a little bit here? Mom, no, not right now. This isn't where it's supposed to kind of start. This isn't where my, my miracles begin at a wedding. What? Mom, mom, not now. Mom, please. You know what? Do whatever he says. And she walks away and you're like, mom, come back. Mom, oh, my God just fill it with water. Like, what's going on? What's the human texture of what Jesus is doing? God with us. But there is something going on in reluctant obedience because Jesus' mother is confident in something he can do. She's confident in this son that was born in her of the Holy Spirit and has been raised up faithfully to display God's salvation to the world. Mary probably didn't know, but Jesus would become salvation to the world. So Mary sees something in Jesus, and in obedience to his mother's request, what we see is that he shows that God cares for the intimate parts of our life. God gets involved in a wedding in Cana and does something to prolong the celebration. Why does God care about a wedding? Why does God care about this thing going on? I want to just stop for a minute and remind you that Jesus Christ has referred to himself as the bridegroom and the church his bride. How fitting that his first miracle would set the table to celebrate well the coming together of one man and one woman. Do you see that what's going on here may point to a little bit bigger truth? 
do you see all the other little elements going on that Jesus takes water and it becomes wine? What, what really could be looked at in this is maybe Jesus Christ when he's crucified and they run the spear into his side, what flows out of his side? But a mixture of water and blood. And when we take communion, the wine is representative of the blood, which is the New Testament that he wrote with his own blood. We recognize that this is bigger than we give it credit for. This is really important. Jesus Christ prolongs a party with wine because it's worth celebrating. And he does an intimate celebration that speaks to a grander thing. And to you and I, we would think, yeah, this doesn't feel right as Christians, right? I come from teetotaling country, not, not Grand Junction necessarily, but my branch of Christianity growing up. If you drank, you were going straight to hell and you're probably getting there first right? And um, among more European-based traditions, which the Reformed Church would be, it's more normal for someone to have a beer or something like that or a glass of wine, and that's fine. And, um, and I'm good with that, but I think the thing that um, for me in this is this is a scripture we never talked about when I was little because, well, I mean, of course, Jesus turned water into wine to show that they were sinners, but he wouldn't himself drink, would, would he? See, it gets uncomfortable when we talk about real life intermingling with the real person of Jesus Christ. But Jesus Christ turned water into wine and the people had already had enough to drink. It wasn't the Christian thing to do, was it? According to our standards. There's another thing that Jesus does regarding the temple. And what Jesus does regarding the temple is amazing. Now we have to understand, the temple is like um, at this time of year at Passover, which is the high holy day of all Judaism, the Jewish people all come home for Passover. There would be close to a million people on the Temple Mount at Passover. It would have been packed. And Jesus walks in to the million, the, the, the masses of people and sees them selling and treating his house as a market. And Jesus does the Christian thing of forming a whip and wailing on people and yelling at them and ruining their businesses. Okay, that's not good in our mind, is it? Are you good with that? Has anybody ever come into your business and been like, I'm tired of how you do this? Whoops! And you're like, you just hit me with a whip. No, we don't do that. Again, we're dutched. We don't scream if we're on fire. This should make you very uncomfortable. In this community, we'd be like, if Jesus came in here ransacking and throwing tables, it would make us very uncomfortable. Jesus doesn't do the nice, easy thing. He was compelled to do something about the sin and the profiteering that was going on in a house of worship. And Jesus was ticked, and he showed it. He didn't show it in the nice Christian way of, my anger burns within me and I will pray for you. No, he formed a whip out of three cords, and he began hitting the animals and flipping the tables of the money changers. He does what people would say is not the Christian thing to do. But he had to clear out what was going on in his father's house because the temple was intended for a purpose and they were not living into it. And Jesus Christ was not going to allow it to continue unchecked. Why these two things in our life? Why would, the, why would the gospel of John take the water into wine and the temple and kind of put these stories back to back? That's a good question. What is the apostle John trying to tell us? I think one of the things that could be said is he's trying to tell us, don't try to structure everything according to human institution. Jesus Christ is that creative force of all nature, the very first word of creation. When Jesus comes back, he's going to do things that are difficult for us to understand, but he calls us to live in the same spirit. He calls us to live out, as Chuck Swindoll would say, on the ragged edge of faith where he is displaying the heart of the Father and showing the indignant anger of the Father at the way the temple is being treated. For you and I, it gets really, really uncomfortable because at the best day, Jesus loses his mind and drives people out. On Easter Sunday morning, churches in America are full, full. Everybody comes home for Easter, right? You come home for Easter, 
Imagine what it was like on our high holy day if Jesus were to come in and say, you have abused my temple and began overturning our lives. How would we feel? See, what Jesus is doing by our standards, not his, but by our standards, is not the Christian thing to do. So maybe we should question if all these Christian things to do are actually the right thing. Are they pleasing to God? Are they the things God would want us to have? So what we need to do is look and say, okay, what is Jesus doing in this that allows us to see him in a new light? to see God in a new light, and be challenged to become like God. Remember, at the Foundry Church, we believe we are to be transformed into the image of Christ, never Christ into our image. We are becoming like him. We are not asking him to take on our sinful lives. We're asking forgiveness, and then we're transformed into his image. What is Jesus calling us to be transformed into? So what we have to do is look at this and really unpack it with three applications. And these may seem a little strange, but we're going to work into them. First thing is, don't take yourself so seriously. When we start taking ourselves very seriously, I believe we get pompous, we get religious, and people have a hard time approaching. Have you ever approached someone who takes themselves too seriously, and you walk up and they're like, yes. You're like, oh, you know what? I would rather be ignorant. And you just walk off because seeing the smugness and seriousness of their life makes you go, I I would rather be alone than with you. Because as serious as you take yourself, I'm just, I don't know, that's not me. What about this? What about if we look at Jesus and we realize he didn't take himself so seriously? What Jesus did at at the wedding in Cana didn't fit in with what would be considered good or normal. He was reluctant. Did you ever think of that? People always say Jesus was fully divine and he wasn't held down by humanity. I disagree. He was fully human and fully divine, merged into one person. And he was reluctant. We would say he was nervous, he was scared, he was, he was hesitant. He's the guy on the high dive going, okay, I'll do it in a minute. Oh, okay. We don't like to think of Jesus nervous, but he was reluctant. He was reluctant to do what his mother asked him. And what she asked him to do was strange, and it called him into a bizarre obedience. And we don't like to be bizarre, do we? Anybody ever wake up and say, today is my day to be a freak? Yeah, you wake up and you're like, you know what? I remember in my youth, and I'm not judging today's fashions. I don't know really where they're at. My wife dresses me. Um, (laughs) She does. I'm colorblind and dyslexic. It could get ugly. Um, But but when I was little, my mom bought me cords, corduroy. Oh, oh. It was like being set on fire. It was awful. I would walk and I'd be like, boom, boom, boom. And I was like, oh. I sound like that new music by Run DMC. I just didn't like it. I was uncomfortable and I felt stupid and I thought everybody would look and be like, that boy's wearing corduroy, beat on him. That's how I felt. I felt like a freak. I felt like cast out of society by something I wore. I didn't want to be bizarre. I didn't want to do something that set me apart. But Jesus was called to a bizarre obedience. He was called to do something that was bizarre and do something that made him uncomfortable in the life he was living. The Holy Spirit may prompt you to do something or to act on his behalf so that he may reveal part of his character through your life. And it may call you to a bizarre obedience. You may think it's not the right time or setting for what God invites you to do, but you have to obey. A lot of people don't know this, but the, the, the Trinity... Father, Son, Holy Spirit, God, three in one. Um, There is two masculine pronouns for the Son and the Father. There is one pronoun that is neutered in terms of its gender. It is neither male nor female. It's the Holy Spirit. Now, it's not universally uh, neutered in the way that it's it's used, but one of the uh, theological questions is, is the Holy Spirit representative of? of the mother heart of God. 
you're leaning against a light switch. All right, um, <laughs> I'm sorry. Just go that way, just a little to in the back there. There you go. All right, sorry, don't look back at him. Don't shame him. He's being bizarrely obedient. Thank you for helping me. All right, it was awesome. The light's just going on, but he's like, I don't know, I just feel like I understand more. All right, <laughs> this is gonna happen. I'm getting through this. All right, yeah, but you, you, you may not know this, but the Holy Spirit could be called the mother heart of God. He created humanity in his image, male and female, he created them. There is a maternal heart to God. There is a maternal femininity to God. There is this wonderful reality that in his image we were created male and female. And sometimes, don't we look like Jesus? Mom, not now. Not now. Not in front of these people. Come on. Come on. Have you ever been prompted by the Holy Spirit to do something bizarre and out of place? I want to invite you to know that if you haven't been prompted, you should ask him to start doing it. Because the life of a Christian should be modeled after the life of Christ. And Christ's mother invited him to do something he was uncomfortable with, and so will the Holy Spirit in your life. You need to stop taking yourself so seriously so that your mother or the Holy Spirit, God the Father, your family can call you into service for his kingdom. If we take ourselves quite, if we start taking ourselves less seriously, we might be much more willing to obey in the bizarre things. Anybody have that friend growing up who was willing to do anything? Remember him or her? I love that kid. I was that kid. Um, I, I will tell you this. In a lot of ways, that's what we should grow up to be as Christians. Is there anything we wouldn't do to obey and please the heart of God? Second thing is this. Remember the things that Jesus takes seriously. Jesus did take seriously one thing, and it was the temple where he lived, where, the, where God the Father created, had his people build a temple to specific regulations to be a place where God was worshiped. Jesus didn't take cultural expectations and, you know, kind of allowing the status quo to continue as God. Jesus took something more serious than the way people felt about his behavior. Jesus took seriously the fact of the purpose of the temple. I will remind you again of the words of the Apostle Paul. Do you Christians not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Should we not take seriously the lives we live and the questions we deal with the choices we make because our lives, our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And according to Jesus, he takes it very seriously what's going on in our life. So it invites us to our last thing, to clean the temple, to clean the temple. And people are like, oh, good, you're sitting out there, you're like, all right, three steps to a better me. Uh-uh, that's not it today. I do have one step. You can't do it yourself. Notice that the profiteers in Jesus' day had set up shop in the temple. They were profaning God's temple to make money and they were doing their best at it. Notice that Jesus had to form a whip. Let me ask you this. Who of my friends were raised in the 80s in here? Any of us? When you hear the song, dun da dun 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 whip cracking good time Indiana Jones, right? When I was little, I was given an Indiana Jones bull whip. I don't know why, but it was awesome. And I was out on my trampoline one day, and I picture myself wearing short 80s gym shorts, no shirt, just feral, and uh, having a great time. And I was like, whoop, pow, and I'm snapping my whip. The neighbors had to be like, that kid, right? But I'm out there, and I was like, whack, quack, and it caught me <laughs> on the back of the hamstring and dropped me like a bag of hammers. I was like, oh! And I grabbed my leg, I hit the ground, I was like, I've been whipped. I, here's the reality. We better hand over the whip to the one who knows how to use it. Jesus Christ formed a whip to drive out of his temple that which profaned it. Can you allow me a moment of awkward honesty? At seven years old, I was exposed to pornography. Seven. One of the neighbor kids showed it to me, and I found it all together interesting, alluring, and shameful at once. And I lived a life following the stream of those images, chasing them down. I loved it. At 23 years old, I was absolutely alone 
I was ashamed, I was overwhelmed, and I was trapped. No matter how many times I begged God to help me act differently, to help me not pursue those images, those videos, that content, no matter what I did, I couldn't get rid of it. And I was broken, I was alone, I was a missionary, and I was struggling deeply with my faith because this wouldn't go away, and I was dying. I was dying. And I didn't know if my faith would ever allow me to grow up with this in my life. And the temple of my life was thoroughly polluted with images I couldn't erase and images I couldn't quit feeding on. I was a broken young man desperate for help. And I remember when God finally took the whip and began driving it out, but it was only at my invitation. I was always willing to drive pornography out of my life at a young age, but only temporarily. I wouldn't push it out of the temple. I'd just push it to a dark corner and ignore it for a few weeks till it came roaring back. Eventually, I came to a place in the summer of 97 where I broke, and I finally just said, God, I can't do it anymore. I just, I feel owned by this, and I want to tell you something. By the grace of God, from that day forward, I have never looked at pornography again. I have never been involved with the behaviors that go with it. I sat down with a young lady who would eventually become my wife. I met her about a month and a half after God put a stop to what was going on in me. I met Erica, and and once our dating relationship was more secure, I said, look, this is part of who I was. This is part of my past, and I'm scared that it'll come back. And she's been my accountability. And she asked me, and she'll walk up and grab my phone 21 years later. And she flips it open and she starts looking through. And I don't quiver a bit. Not because I'm awesome, but because Jesus Christ formed a three chord whip and drove out of my life that which I could no longer control. And I want to invite you to something. If you're as tired as I was, if you're exhausted with whatever owns you, I want to invite you to let the temple get cleaned. It is not easy. But many things happen in our temple that look good. And we look good on the outside, but our lives are not pleasing to Christ. And he's serious about his temple. And if you, like me, feel owned by things, it is time to hand over to the cleaner the implements of purging his temple. It's not easy. It's not often fun. It feels shameful, but it is transformative. My friends, you individually are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Your life matters. My friends, we as a young church in this town are a living gathering of the Holy Spirit. What we do here may look fine to religion sometimes, but not please the heart of God. So we at this church always have to be willing to cut things away that may be successful but don't honor God. We have to be people willing to be serious about the temple of the Holy Spirit. And I want to remind you again, my battle with pornography as a young man was never won by this man. I was found broken, wrecked, and ruined. And God did something in my life that absolutely transformed me. I'm a living testimony that it doesn't win the battle if we give to Jesus the power to own his temple. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, we, uh, we recognize that in so many ways we are broken. And in so many ways we think that we can control this life. But the joy and the fun and the wonder of all of this is that you are God with us. And that you can come in and clean what is broken. You can transform what is malformed. And you can bring life to that which is dead. So we ask, Lord Jesus Christ, as we prepare our hearts to sing for just a moment, we ask that you would meet us in this moment of worship. You would show us the things that break your heart, and then that you would be God with us, that you wouldn't leave us in our brokenness and our sin and our shame, but you would join us in the process of being transformed by obeying you and by giving control of this life we live over to you. Come, Lord Jesus Christ, and be who you have always been, the only king and head of your church, the one who rules faithfully over the lives of the temple. 
that our lives may speak of your gospel and your grace. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. It seems weird to say that Jesus was reluctant at his first miracle, doesn't it? It seems weird to say that when he turned water into wine, he was, he was maybe uneasy, uncomfortable, and in a bizarre obedience. But that same pattern would carry on because one night he would stand in a garden where he was reluctant, where he was afraid. And he had just spoken the words to his disciples when he held up the cup of wine and says, this is the New Testament. It is written in my blood. And as often as you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. And then he went to a garden and he prayed fervently, God, please, Father, please, not this. He was afraid. He was reluctant. He is our model. He is the author and perfecter of our faith. So this is what I want to share with you today. If you're afraid, if you're reluctant, you're in good company. You're in good company. Because there is a spirit that calls out to those who are called by the name Christian. And it will fill you and empower you to live a life, not your own, but fully his. And I will tell you this. I am not ashamed of who I was up till I was 23. I'm really excited that God got a hold of me. And I'm excited every day that those memories are further away, that that life is further away and my life in him only increases. I invite you to the journey of being reluctantly and bizarrely obedient to him who has called you by his own name, claimed you with his own blood, and sent you with the power of his spirit. My friends, as you go, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. May the peace of Christ be yours as you begin to live into this transformed new life as the temple of the Holy Spirit. My friends, you must leave the building because the church is dismissed.